Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. The 2019 Manchester International Festival will take place at various venues around the city in July, featuring a huge range of performances across art forms. An edited version of the main presentation at the MIF launch on the 7th of March, in which many of the artists featured in the festival described their works, can be heard in a previous British Theatre Guide podcast episode, but we also spoke directly to some of the artists involved. Later, you can hear our interviews with Leo Warner of 59 Productions about Invisible Cities and Failing McDermott on his collaboration with composer Philip Glass, Dow of Glass. But first, I asked MIF Artistic Director John McGraw for his highlights of the theatre programme. Well, of course, they're they're all highlights because we spend so much time working on each of them and we get so close to the work. But from a theatre perspective, I'm maybe to focus focus on that work, although it's always hard with the festival to say what the boundaries are between the art forms. Um, But I'm really thrilled about the Philip Glass, Phelan Maturma collaboration at the Royal Exchange. It's a really significant um, new composition from Philip and the the conversation that him and Phelan have had about making the work and some of the actual really quite deep questions they're asking about life, death and the universe should make a really, really special thing and I think something that will have a, a life for many years to come because it's a brand new piece of Philip Glass music. Obviously, we're delighted to have Maxine back, and also that you know she's using the festival as she should to push the envelope of what she does. So, working a lot with music, I'm working with this orchestra of young women, and with the wonderful composer Anna Klein, and of course with Sarah Frankham to imagine Nico not as a biopic, not as a theatricalization in that sense, but more as a kind of evocation, really, of the spirit of the woman. Um, obviously, we're delighted to be starting a, hopefully a long-term collaboration with Ivo van Hov um, as part of the journey towards the factory and um, bringing you know, a, a piece of work that I think will be potentially quite controversial in the festival, Read the Fountainhead, yeah. which is, uh, of course, an adaptation of Ayn Rand's book. And Ayn Rand is the heroine of the, of the alt-right in many ways, yeah. and of the libertarian right. So really digging into and exploring that quite challenging text um, and then, of course, also the special event that he'll create for us, recreating Europe with his actors and guests like Juliet Stevenson, reflecting on the stories that Europe's told itself over many centuries about what Europe could be in this very poignant moment for, for us in the UK in relation to the continent. So a whole series, I think, of, of works that, in a way, come from a theatre tradition. And then, of course, all of the work that will be very performative and theatrical, but it's happening in underground spaces or in um, truly unusual locations. So what's it been like for you? This is your second festival, isn't it, now? Yeah. So you were thrown into it last year. Yeah. This is very different to anything that you were doing uh, National Theatre of Wales on or at uh, certainly a contact you're suddenly with all these uh, major world stars to me the the principles are the same it's about exploring with fantastic artists whether those are the very young artists that we had a contact or whether they're Yoko Ono and Laurie Anderson what are the stories that people want to tell now how what are the forms that are going to best open up those explorations and what can we as producers and curators and artistic directors and a, a company do to make that happen so the artists may change they may in some cases be a lot more established but the, the question is the same and the thing that I love about MIF that really is consistent with National Theatre Wales and with Contact is it's also about what could you make here it's not just some abstract idea of art, but it is about an art that is is rooted in a conversation with the place that it's happening in. So what is the relationship with Manchester? Because you're bringing in artists from all over the world, but it's still rooted in Manchester. That's a fine balance, isn't it? Yeah, but I think that, that at its best, the festival is profoundly international and deeply local, and, yeah. and that's the goal. 
and so this year there's been all sorts of initiatives around embedding the festival more in the city um, some as simple as handing over one of the commissions to a group of young people from contact to make that commission and they were extraordinary you know they came up with lists of hundreds of artists some of whom I knew well some of whom I'd never heard of I shared the whole program with them so they could tell me what was missing and what they wanted to look for so in that way you know really relating to the city in the, in the bread and butter of the festival what do we commission but also building a connection with the city with a lot of the work so you talk Manchester from Rimini Protocol really explores the fabric of Manchester and then also having more and more work that is just free and open to people so Bells for Peace is a big free open event you can choose to work on it and prepare for it for months or you can just turn up on the night and it will also be an extraordinary thing for you so making sure that the festival is really approachable to people and we've been doing a lot of work over the last two years year round in the city to make sure that although the festival as an event happens once every two years and has that excitement of something that doesn't come around that often the groundwork behind it in the city is happening every day so has it been an easier second time round it's uh now you've established some links yeah I mean I knew Manchester well so that part for me is a really wonderful and rewarding element of the work in terms of the last festival I had about a year and a half slightly less to, to put it together from zero whereas with this one I've had you know really some of these works have been in development for three years so I think that you see that in the um you could see it today, actually, in the depths of the stories that the artists were telling about the work, that it's things that people have, in some cases, had quite a long period of time to gestate and think about and allow for, for change in the work. But at the same time, it is always thrilling to you know, make something fast. So I think we always also need to make space for the work that we didn't know we were going to do, the response to the moment, the artist that just pops up and surprises you. Uh, when you were at Contact, I don't think there was a, a Manchester International Festival, and there was a Manchester City of Drama in the 1990s, which Contact was involved in. But has Manchester changed in that intervening time? Is it a different Manchester that you're coming back to now? I think Manchester's ever-changing, to be honest. And, and certainly Manchester now is at a moment of real confidence, I would say. So I think that maybe that's the single thing that I most notice. Of course, there's the buildings. Of course, there's you know all, all the extraordinary things that are happening. But I think there's a confidence here now, both in the artistic community, but also wider about what this city is, the place that it has in the world, the ways in which it's special, and the spirit of the place. So I suppose you're already working on next year's, are you? I'm already working. It's not next year, fortunately. It's 2021, but I am already working on it, yeah. That was John McGrath, Artistic Director of the Manchester International Festival, speaking to me at the official launch event for the festival. Also at this event, I spoke to Leo Warner of 59 Productions, a company that has been responsible for some stunning uses of technology in theatre, from major touring productions such as Sting's The Last Ship, to smaller scale regional theatre productions like Home Manchester and Lyric Hammersmith's City of Glass, and even the London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. For MIF, Leo is directing an adaptation of another novel at least as challenging as Paul Oster's City of Glass, as he explained to me. My name's Leo Warner. I'm one of the directors of a company called 59 Productions, and we're co-producing with uh, MIF, Ron Bear and Carl Sidow uh, a production of Invisible Cities, written by Lolita Chakrabarti. It's based on a novel by Italo Calvino, and it's, a, it's an extraordinary novel in that it imagines uh, a meeting between Kublai Khan and Marco Polo, a series of conversations between the two men, in which these sort of visions of cities, both real and fantastical, are kind of conjured up. Um, and the cities have kind of narrative meaning within the novel, so they're sort of using architecture to tell an emotional story. So being somewhat addicted to trying to stage impossible to stage stories, I picked this novel up as a, a possible source for adaptation a couple of years ago and we've basically been developing this project. And what we've come up with is a, a very clear sort of narrative between these two men, but they don't share a common language. So the visions of these cities that are conjured up are manifested through the uh, production design, um, which is part architectural, part physical, 
part projection and light. And then, and then the other half of that language is somewhere between physical movement and dance. And so there's this sort of hybrid language, which is about uh, the expression of these cities, but it's told non-verbally. So we've created this, uh, I guess, sort of cross art form piece. It's somewhere between theatre and dance and an event and an installation or a piece of architecture that seeks to sort of tell some of these narratives. 59 Productions seems to be appearing on more and more theatre programmes at the moment. It's suddenly become massive, and it's your job to construct this, these magical worlds. But it sounds like you're more involved on the creating of the project side, because the, the, sort, the sorts of jobs that you do, they, they're often come afterwards, don't they, after the story, after the... Yes, play. I mean, a, a, like, a 59 Productions is, um, you know, co- coming up for a couple of decades old, and historically we did well initially purely projection design and animation and then we built in, uh, into scenic design and production design and we now have an architecture department in-house there's 35 people there in the whole company and we are very much sort of exist in that hinterland between industries and art forms we don't really discriminate in terms of the way that we operate a project between you know a big architectural project or a public art commission that might involve projection mapping a building or a piece of fringe theatre so we kind of apply the same tools and the same storytelling principles to all of our work but that work is now massively diverse yes, yes. I've seen some of your work it goes right from big scale Olympic size yes, yes. things to uh, I remember an amazing thing that it was your company that did um, at, the, at home in Manchester yes that's right so, so the other thing that's happened is as we've taken as you say sort of increasingly more, more significant creative roles in projects and got involved in the origination of concepts and stories as well as the sort of servicing the design element of them we've started to think about ways to um, realise our own sort of original ideas and um, the, the production I think you're referring to City of Glass was the first piece that we produced ourselves so we self-produced that because we just wanted I suppose maximum creative input and we're like well actually probably that is just to do it to make ourselves the client yes. <laughs> and have total sort of creative say in the thing. Obviously, this, this uh, collaboration with MIF is much more of a co-production, and we've been able to also therefore harness the sort of resources of MIF and Rombear and their ability to forge these big international partnerships, some of which come through 59, some of which come through Manchester. So, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting time for the company as well as for like this, this extraordinary project. One thing I noticed about City of Glass, because I've read a lot of Paul Austin novels, right. the thing that I loved about it was the style of how it sort of unfolded on the stage was very much like Paul Austin's very good. style well, on the thank page. Thank for saying so, yeah. I mean, our challenge on that one, it's not a dissimilar challenge to yeah. this one, is to sort of how to make the whole space a kind of living character in a way. Yeah. And, you know, in that one we had the very literal, you know, interpretation that the whole stage is somehow the inside of Quinn's head, really. And he can never leave. If he walks out one door, he just walks in through another one. Yeah. Um, and so the whole space manifested his psyche, as it were. Now, this is a very different project, a very different production, and these cities need to speak like characters in some way. But some of the same sort of slightly hard-to-grasp sort of metatextual, conceptual stuff, like, tracks through both projects. It's no mistake that I sort of ended up conceiving and directing both of these things. So the problem is that um, so much technology, it's very impressive, but there's a lot to go wrong, isn't there? You must, there must be a lot of times when you're on Ten Talks about whether he said it's all going to work. Yeah, I mean, th- there is a lot of technology involved in this particular production, and, um, you know, I'm not that interested in technology per se. Like, it just has to g- go away, it has to disappear, yeah, yeah. But, but, but service the show and, yeah. and make the production work. Um, so, yes, it'd be very nice if everything went swimmingly from start to finish, but I'm sure we'll hit... You know, we've got the challenges of this incredibly complex venue as well as the, um, you know, the complexities of the source text. So, you know, fingers crossed, we've got an amazing team, but, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a tough one. What else are you working on at 59 at the moment? There's a usual sort of eclectic selection of radically different industry work all over the world. There's some um, projection mapping, like large-scale projection mapping shows, some more theatre, some in- very interesting exhibition design stuff. And then the sort of public artwork events type things. I mean, we do between 20 and 30 big projects a year in very, very different industries all over the world. So I check the website. I'd say I can barely keep up myself. That was Leah Warner of 59 Productions on Invisible Cities, which were performed at Mayfield beside Piccadilly Station in Manchester from the 4th to the 14th of July. 
Manchester-born Phelan McDermott, founder of theatre company Improbable, has directed plays and operas around the world, including a few of the works of his musical hero of the last 35 years, Philip Glass. For this year's MIF, Glass has created ten brand new pieces of music in collaboration with Phelim, which will be performed in the round at Manchester's Royal Exchange Theatre for a production titled Dow of Glass. I asked Phelim to try to describe the project. I guess it's that thing where you are, you get asked what it is and each day you go, now what does it? what is it today? <laughs> <laughs> What's the version of the story I'm going to tell today? I guess it's a show that I'm going to be in and I'll be performing in. It's going to have music that's been composed by Philip Glass. And I guess there's a little journey towards how that's come about because the last thing that I did that was a Philip Glass piece was a big opera at Norton that I've just done at the English National Opera. And that's, in some ways, on the large scale, is the culmination of a journey of my interest, stroke, obsession, <laughs> infatuation with Philip's music and how that fits into theatre, um, because I think there's a certain aspect of what Philip's done in opera and theatre, which, which means a certain kind of performance comes about. And I was going to do another show with Philip. We were talking about adapting a children's book together. It was actually a, a Sendak book, uh, the guy who wrote uh, Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah. And for various reasons, that project fell through, didn't happen. And in the space where that show isn't happening and new shows kind of emerged and it's been a little practice in if you wait and if you ask certain questions and dream a little bit and see what happens is there something that happens that emerges in that space that's left behind yeah. um, so it's called it's called the Dow of glass and in a, in a way that little process of finding out what's the show that might happen if you really listen and attend to kind of more sort of minimal signals is the story of following the Tao rather than following the plan that you have for how things are going to work out. Yeah. I'll be on stage. I'll be storytelling. There'll be puppeteers with me on stage, creating images that help me tell those stories. But most of all, there'll be these, what currently are 10 pieces of music, which Philip's written. And I guess you'd say, He's written them in conversation with me and with certain questions that I've been given the opportunity because he's been very open to it of getting in a rehearsal room with him, me storytelling and him actually improvising and composing at the piano and then going away and turning that into what looks like a real score. <laughs> this sounds like it's um, the last time I spoke to you was was about Animo, which was. Uh, puppets and improvisation it it sounds like it, it is a distant relation of that is that what we're going to see on stage at the royal exchange i mean i think so yeah in the sense that that show which is improvised in front of the audience is not dissimilar from what the process in the rehearsal room might be except that it will move towards in in a devising process uh, will move towards a show that is very fixed not very fixed but fixed in terms of a structure it's not going to be improvised totally because there's some extraordinary philip glass music that needs to be played so it, it is related to that and as you say it's at the royal exchange theater so part of the storytelling of the show i would say will probably involve my relationship to that theater as a place where i spend my childhood watching the you know the very first shows that happened there and wanting to do theatre there, and in some ways having a dream, a plan that I might end up working there one day as an actor or directing there, that never quite worked out. But now it is working out in a way that I never would imagine. Yeah, there's a couple of dreams coming together, working with a hero for of, of yeah. 35 years in the theatre yeah. that, that you dreamed of putting something on uh, yeah. back in in the 70s, was it, if you say, it was when, it, when the theatre first started? Well, in the olden days, the beginning <laughs> of theatre. Uh, so I was I kind of left college in 85. Um, so the first show that I made when I left college, I went to Middlesex, what was then Middlesex Polytechnic. Remember yeah. them? Yes. Uh, <laughs> was uh, an Ian McEwan short story that I adapted with a, a company that I had then, and we used Philip Glass music for that show. 
So it, the the thread of his music weaves its way through a lot of the work that I've done in theatre. Yeah. And coming to the Royal Exchange, you were introduced yeah. at the launch by John McGrath as uh, yeah. Manchester-born director. You're performing this in the Manchester International Festival, but you've mm. worked all around the world. Does, does it feel like coming home to Manchester, or it, it, does that not mean as much to you anymore, do you think? I, mean, I think it means... It, there's no way it's not going to mean something. I think what's slightly strange about my relationship to Manchester is having left in the 80, early 80s, you do think you're going to come back to your hometown and work there, and it's never really happened. I did bring the first show that Improbable made, which was 70 Hill Lane, to Manchester, and we did it at the Green Room. What was the Green Room then? And that story, I don't know if you know about this, that story was about the house that I grew up in, Blakely. All right. And it was about the poltergeist that was in my house in, Manchester, <laughs> in Blakely. So... You know, the, even though uh, I've not been working in Manchester, sometimes Manchester's come with me when I've right. been on the road <laughs> in the stories that I've told. Uh, so it, it, I'd say it means a lot to come back and to, to kind of, you know, be given the opportunity to to tell some stories, to create some theatre in that space that I really, you know, I really uh, grew to love theatre and uh, watching those shows at the Royal Exchange. So uh, it's a big thing. Yeah. And Philip Glass, they always say, don't meet your heroes, but this, this seems yeah. to have worked out for you. What, what's it been like working with him? What's the, you brought some of, it sounds like you brought some of your methods of creating theatre to him, but uh, what's the process been like between you? You know, Philip's kind of extraordinary. He's 82 and uh, he's classified as a, you know, a new composer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, the opera that I just directed was first done, I think, 35 years ago. And that's that's very new in the world of opera. Yeah. And he, in making those shows that I did, he was very, very generous in the sense that he was very supportive. But he said, look, I, these shows that you're doing, I really don't want to know how you're going to do it, what you're going to do. I don't want any approval on that. I want you to create your the work that you're going to do. Because I think he believes if those operas are going to survive and they're going to keep being done, they need to prove that they can be done lots of, different ways yeah, yeah. and I, I think you know there's been a sort of little journey there of him actually liking the shows and how they've done and they've done pretty well ended up going to the metropolitan opera in new york which is for him a big thing to get those operas into that that space uh, which is often you know harder to get new operas in there a big sort of a big thing in in both our lives doing that that, that gig and then slowly i think i had a little dream about how Philip first started out and anyone who's read his memoir which is I really recommend reading it's really fascinating he was a you know the way that he made his uh, way as a composer was he was a plumber and he was a, a New York taxi driver and that's how he funded his you know his work initially and then to become in effect one of the most famous live composers in the world now but he's still got that I'd say he's still got that humility about him and I thought well what was it like when Philip started out? You know, he would get in a rehearsal room and he'd muck around with musicians and theatre makers. So there's a little dream about getting him back into the rehearsal room in a way that's more like how he first started making work. So to actually, and it's been a process of, you know, wooing him, inviting him into the rehearsal room and wondering if he would turn up, you know, it might just come once in a week. The last you know, uh, workshop at one, he came and we were told, oh, he'll maybe come in for, you know, half an hour for two afternoons. He came in the whole week, beginning of the week and said, uh, we've, we've got to do a run on Saturday. We best get going. I was like, oh, my word. You know, so he's been actually a driving force. And the fact that he, you know, wrote these 10 pieces of music, improvising and then working on them. It's been kind of extraordinary, really. And one of those things where I've been like, don't think too hard about the fact that that's Philip Glass playing the piano over there. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so he, and he's just, you know, I think he's really enjoyed that process. And, you know, he's basically, he, he, he does want to hang out and create. And then in the breaks, take us to the Himalayan curry house that's just over the road. <laughs> he's an extraordinary, you know, humble and wise guy you know and he's it's a real honor for me to have been in that process with him it's a real clash of ideals in a, in a sense in that he's 
producing in the world that he comes from he's producing things where works for posterity he's trying to get yeah. works into the canon whereas you come from a more improvisation background where it's for the moment and then it then it, it's it's um it's ephem- more ephemeral isn't it I, I guess so yeah although i suppose with this show there's something about trying to tell the i think one of the things the show's about is how do you tell the story of how you make a show yeah in a way that's not you know that's enjoyable and communicate some ideas around how we make shows you know i think the thing about theater as you say is it, it all theater really is it's it, it, it's ephemeral it, it, it's about the live moment and i think that's it's it's you know it's, it's strength that it's a live event uh, as the world gets more and more about you know recorded yeah. technology and whatever the work that I like, even if it does involve technology and it does involve kind of say big stage effects, how do you make sure it doesn't lose that essence of what makes theatre the most important thing for me, you know, in terms of making? So you, I'm sure you're not just working on one piece. You're, you've always got lots of things that on. So what else are you working on alongside this? I mean, actually, the next the next thing that's in our uh, big thing in our diary is that we're doing a big international conference about improvisation. It's called the GII, the Global Improvisation Initiative, and it's a a big conference, a little bit of a slight homecoming of going back to working with Middlesex University. Now university, you see, the world moves on, polytechnics have gone. And it's an event that's inviting people from all over the globe to talk about improvisation. It's practiced not just in theatre, but in different things like science, psychology all these different areas and sharing knowledge about that you know there will be some academics giving some papers about aspects of improvisation but there'll also be some people doing some crazy improv gigs (laughs) so it's a a good mixture i think that was failing mcdermott on his collaborative piece with composer philip glass dow of glass which will be at the royal exchange theater in manchester from the 11th to the 20th of july The Manchester International Festival 2019 will take place at various venues from the 4th to the 21st of July. For more information, see mif.co.uk. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.